Thank you all for coming. Good evening and <laughs> welcome to the second centenary lecture of the Department of Politics and International Studies today delivered by Professor James Scott from Yale um, University. Now we're very happy to have you here. We know that you're uh, basically having also lots of exams and we're competing against the nice weather outside as well. And so um, I appreciate you all coming. So my name is Michael Bueller. I'm going to chair tonight's uh, session. Now before we basically have uh, the talk delivered by Professor James Scott. I just want to say a few things um, um, uh, um, uh, with regard to future events and then a couple of announcements as well. Um, so Professor uh, James Scott will talk for about 50 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A for about 30 minutes. After that, we have a reception upstairs to uh, which you're all invited. So it's just one floor up in this very same building and that will follow um, the uh, uh, Q&A. Now, um, we also actually have a third centenary lecture planned for the fall semester. It's going to be on the 28th of November, if that's correct, and James Piscatori will actually talk um, here at SOAS in this very same room. Now, uh, the details are not finalized yet, but if you're interested in coming to the next lecture, I encourage you to sign up to the SOAS Facebook uh, page or the SOAS um, uh, 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 calendar, and there you will then see um, uh, these um, announcements. Now, um, what I also need to say is that uh, basically tonight's event would not have been possible without the help of uh, a couple of people, most importantly, um, Marina English, actually, who has worked countless hours. <laughs> to make this event happen. Now, last time she was hiding outside. I don't know if she's here tonight or if she's, uh, where? She's outside, all right, she's, hide she's hiding outside, but like basically she's in charge and she's responsible and we're very, very happy and, and fortunate to actually, here she is. <laughs> Um, I would also like to thank the technicians who are here tonight, and I want to just remind you that this event is being filmed, so by base, basically being here, you have given us our, uh, your consent to, to, to being filmed, and um, I also want to um, uh, emphasize that the Q&A is being filmed as well, so if you have a very um, uh, important question, you will see yourself on YouTube in a couple of um, uh, days from now. Um, so this is basically all I have to say in terms of announcements or the technicalities of tonight's talk. I'll now hand over to Mark Laffey, the head of the politics department, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Michael. Um, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege this evening to introduce our centennial speaker, Professor James Scott of Yale University. Uh, Professor Scott, I think it's fair to say, is one of the most distinguished and influential social scientists in the world. It's an honor to have him with us today. Of course, such a person really needs no introduction. Uh, nonetheless, I've been tasked to do so. So I'll try to keep this uh, short and to the point. Uh, Professor Scott received his PhD in political science from Yale University in 1967. Subsequently, he moved to the University of Wisconsin-Madison before returning to Yale in 1976, and he has taught there ever since. He is currently the Sterling Professor of Political Science and Professor of Anthropology uh, and Director of the Agrarian Studies Program, a role which he has held since 1991. Professor Scott is the author of eight books, including such influential works as The Moral Economy of the Peasant, Rebellion and Subsistence in Southeast Asia, Weapons of the Weak, Everyday Forms of Peasant Resistance, Domination and the Arts of Resistance, Hidden Transcripts, and Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Failed. More recently, his work has taken an anarchist turn, leading to works such as The Art of Not Being Governed, An Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia, and Two Cheers for Anarchism, Six Easy Pieces on Autonomy, Dignity, and Meaningful Work and Play. <coughs> Mr. Scott does not believe in citation indexes, uh, which he lampoons in Two Cheers for Anarchism, which I thoroughly recommend, uh, but they do provide a crude measure of his influence. So if you'll allow me. The Moral Economy of the Peasant has been cited over 5,000 times, Weapons of the Weak almost 10,000 times, Domination and the Arts of Resistance almost 9,000 times, and Seeing Like a State, the most recent of these works, over 11,000 times. By any measure, this is a scholarly life of richness and creativity. Indeed, it's a mark of how influential his writings have been that many of the ideas they contain, such as the weapons of the weak, hidden transcripts, seeing like a state, have become part of the everyday language of the social sciences and humanities, far beyond the study of Southeast Asia, peasants, and political science. Indeed, Professor Scott's career, the immense impact of his studies of how power works, 
not least for those at the bottom of the social scale, stands as a striking counterpoint to many of the defining features of the field of which he is, nevertheless, a distinguished professor. In the past, Professor Scott has talked about writing a boring dissertation at Yale, one which he said sank without a trace. Indeed, he's also suggested, probably joking, uh, but perhaps not, that he had the basis for a class action suit against political science for having bungled his education. <laughs> his real education began, he said, when he moved to Wisconsin in 1967 as a Southeast Asianist at the height of the Vietnam War. In his own words, there were demonstrations every day at the university with tear gas, etc., and I found myself teaching courses on the Vietnam War with 800 students. I taught with a friend who was a China specialist, Ed Friedman. We taught a course on peasant revolution. We would give a lecture and 60 or 70 students who thought we were insufficiently progressive would go away after the lecture, write a rebuttal of our lecture, which they would then hand out to all the students at the next class. <laughs> Any of my students in here no ideas, okay? <laughs> this continued for the entire semester and was quite extraordinary. Professor Scott's first book, The Moral Economy of the Peasant, grew directly out of his experience of teaching Southeast Asian politics at Wisconsin in the midst of a Southeast Asian war. It was his attempt to understand peasant rebellion. In his own words, I decided about that time that since peasants were the most numerous class in world history, it seemed to me that you could have a worthy life studying the peasantry. If development is about anything, it ought to be about peasant livelihoods and the improvement of peasant lives more generally. They also stand at the origins of wars of national liberation, as the Vietnam War was for the Vietnamese. One of the abiding features of Professor Scott's work is a commitment to an interpretive and phenomenological understanding of social science. The still, to some, surprising idea that non-elites, workers, women, Vietnamese peasants, are themselves political thinkers with their own purposes, values, and practices. When I was working on the moral economy of the peasant, I read all the peasant novels I could get my hands on, all the oral histories. In short, as much as I could, stuff from the outside of political science. If you want to understand peasants, in other words, or indeed people, as rational, liberating animals, you have to talk to them, to see the world as they do, to understand how they interpret the situation they face, to take seriously the world as they encounter and experience it. One can see here the openings toward a more ethnographic engagement with the study of peasants and of politics more generally. And what about political science? In his own words, that was the point where my intellectual agenda was increasingly less dependent on political science. Most of my colleagues don't consider me to be a real political scientist. And if you ask people who didn't know what I was, most would say I was an anthropologist. I like the idea of not being a member of any discipline. Perhaps a better description would be to see Professor Scott as undisciplined, but not unsystematic or lacking in method. Of course, this doesn't mean that what peasants, or indeed anyone else, has to say should be taken at face value, as if it was the last word. And much of Professor Scott's work has been about precisely this, the many and varied ways in which power and meaning intersect in the micropolitics of everyday life. It has been about the ways in which domination and resistance manifest themselves at the level of lived experience, of shared and contested meanings, of what he refers to as public and private transcripts. Over the years, the ideas, experiences, and histories of the peasants with whom Professor Scott has collaborated as he explored the workings of power in some of its many forms have traveled a long way from Southeast Asia. Indeed, they've traveled around the world, illuminating and informing our understanding. It is, taken together, a model example of what a scholarly life, a life committed to thinking, and then thinking again, and a bit harder, can achieve. Professor Scott, it's an honor to welcome you to so much. Thank you. That was perhaps the most generous introduction I've ever had. And I think maybe I should just stop while I'm ahead. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this is my second uh, talk in this room, which I like a lot. Uh, and the first was, I think, uh, devoted to trying to understand what I call the late Neolithic multi-species resettlement camp. Uh, which is the kind of early sedentary communities in the Middle East. And I'm trying, uh, since I'm reasonably apocalyptic about our environmental situation, I thought it would be interesting to go back and find out how we came to live as we did uh, 
in great heaps of people and domesticated animals and domesticated plants um, and governed by units we call states. Uh, and so this talk today is from the last chapter of a little book that's my effort to understand the early agrarian states. Not, I'm not adding anything original. I am essentially going back and reading what we now know about the early states. Uh, and the last chapter is called partly um, tongue-in-cheek, the golden age of barbarians, but only partly tongue-in-cheek. So I want to begin with an epigram, um, an anonymous epigram. The history of the peasantry is written by the townsmen. The history of the nomads is written by the settled. The history of the hunter-gatherer is written by the farmer. The history of the non-state peoples is written by the court scribes. All may be found in the archives, cataloged under barbarian histories. Looked at from outer space in 2500 BC, the very earliest states, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus Valley, Harappan, would have been scarcely visible. I don't have any images that I'm going to show, but imagine a picture of the globe with these tiny little dots of the very earliest states. Um, in, say, 1500 BC, there would have been a few more centers, uh, the early Mayan kingdoms and the Yellow River kingdoms along the Yellow River. But their overall geographical presence may actually have shrunk. Even at the height of the Roman and the early Han superstates, the area of their effective control would have been stunningly modest. With respect to population, the great majority throughout this period, and arguably up until 1600 AD, were still non-state peoples, by which I mean hunters and gatherers, marine collectors, horticulturalists, swidners, pastoralists, and a good governed or taxed by any state. The frontier, even in the old world, was sufficiently capacious to beckon those who wished to keep the state at arm's length. States, being largely agrarian phenomenon, would, with the exception of some intermontane valleys, have looked like small little alluvial archipelagos located on the floodplains of a handful of major rivers. Again, I ask you to imagine right? The location of the early agrarian kingdoms, all in river valleys and located on floodplains. Powerful as they might become, their sway was ecologically confined to the well-watered rich soils that could support the concentration of labor and grain that is the basis of their power. I call this the grain manpower module. Outside this ecological sweet spot, in arid lands and swamps and marshes and the mountains, they could not rule. Uh, were non-state spaces. These states might mount punitive expeditions and win an engagement or two, but rule was another thing. For the most part, states did not seek to rule such areas. These areas were fiscally sterile. They would not repay the cost of effectively governing them. Instead, states sought <coughs> military allies and proxies in the hinterland and traded to obtain the scarce raw materials that they needed. The hinterland was not simply an ungoverned, or better put, a not yet governed zone, but rather a zone governed from the, uh, their perspective by barbarians and savages. Though hardly precise Linnaean categories, barbarians often denoted hostile pastoral people who posed a military threat to the states, but who might, under certain circumstances, be incorporated. Savages, on the other hand, were seen as foraging and hunting bands, not suitable raw material for civilization at all, who might be ignored, killed, or enslaved. When Aristotle wrote of slaves as tools, like uh, animals, beasts of burden, one imagines that he had in mind savages rather than the barbarian Persians who were quite as civilized as were the Greeks. I should make it crystal clear once again that I'm of course using the term barbarian with my tongue firmly planted in my cheek. The early state was radically unstable for internal structural, epidemiological, and political reasons. It was also vulnerable to predation from other states. But I wish to argue here that the threat posed by barbarians was perhaps the single most important factor, limiting the growth of states for a period measured not in centuries but actually in millennia. From the Amorite incursions into Mesopotamia through the Greek Dark Age, the fragmentation of the Roman Empire, the Yuan Dynasty in China, and perhaps beyond, 
the barbarian presence was the greatest danger to the state's existence, and at the very least, the crucial constraint on its growth. I'm speaking less of the barbarian stars, the Mongols, the Manchu, the Huns, the Mughals, and Osman, than of the countless bands of non-state peoples who, with their raids, relentlessly gnawed on sedentary grain farming communities. Many non-state raiding peoples were, of course, themselves semi-sedentary, such as the Patans, the Kurds, and the Berbers. The way we can best conceptualize this activity, I think, is to see it as an advanced and lucrative form of hunting and gathering. Sedentary communities represented for mobile foragers an irresistible site for concentrated gathering. Some idea of the pickings that they offered can be gained by this inventory of the loot from a large <coughs> hill raid on a lowland settlement in, the, in Western India in late colonial times. 72 bullocks, 106 cows, 55 calves, 11 female buffaloes, important to the sex for reproduction, uh, brass and copper, uh, 54 brass and copper pots, 50 pieces of clothing, nine blankets, 19 iron plows, 65 axes, ornaments, and grain. The period between the first appearance of states and their very recent hegemony over non-state peoples represented, I believe, something of a golden age of barbarians. What I mean is that it was in many ways better to be a barbarian because there were states, so long as those states were not too strong. States were juicy sites for plunder and tribute. Just think of the labor that had gone into the loot that I listed uh, in this earlier raid. Just as the state required sedentary grain growing population for its predations, so did this concentration of settled people with their grain, livestock, manpower, and goods serve as a site of extraction for mobile predators. When the predator's mobility was enhanced by camels, horses, stirrups, or by swift boats of shallow draft, the range and effectiveness of their raids was greatly extended. The returns to barbarian life would have been far less attractive in the absence of these concentrated foraging sites. If we think of the carrying capacity of barbarian ecology, my argument is that it was enhanced by the existence of petty states in much the same way that it would have been enhanced by a propitious stand of wild cereals or a migration of game. It would be hard to tell whether the microparasites, that is to say the disease vectors of sedentary communities, or the outbreaks of macroparasitic raiders contributed most to the limits on the growth of states uh, and their populations. Setting precise dates to this golden age of barbarians is a waste of our time, I think, um, uh, but I will argue briefly that it might extend up to at least 1600. Um, the Amorite incursions in Mesopotamia around 2100 may have represented a notable peak of barbarian troubles, but it was surely not the only occasion on which the Mesopotamian city-states <coughs> faced trouble from their hinterlands. And here we should recall that virtually all our knowledge of barbarian threats comes, of course, from state sources, sources that might well have self-interested reasons to either exaggerate or downplay the danger that came from the barbarian sector. Conscious of the complexities, Barry Cunliffe bravely ventures to propose that, in the Mediterranean at least, the barbarian disruption of the ancient state world lasted for more than a millennium until 200 BCE. Within this period, he identifies particularly the century between 1250 and 1150 as a time when the whole edifice of centralized bureaucratic palace-based exchange fell apart. The virtual abandonment, abandonment of many city centers, state centers at this time, is often attributed to the so-called Sea People invaders, perhaps of Mycenaean or Philistine origin, about whom very little is still known. They raided Egypt in 1224 and again in 1186, along with nomads from the desert to the west of the Nile. At about the same time, fortifications and towers proliferate in the northern Mediterranean, presumably to defend against raiders moving by land and by sea. Over the course of this long millennium, a large proportion of the Mediterranean population 
had been displaced not once, but several times. At the end of this period, on the other side of the Eurasian continent, the Qin and Han dynasties were having their own troubles with the Qiangnu tribal confederacy over control of the lands in the Ordos Loop of the Yellow River. In the middle of Eurasia, Bennett Bronson claims that the relative absence of any strong states in the Indian subcontinent was due largely to the, the many powerful nomadic raiding groups who prevented states from consolidating. From 1000 BC to 800 AD, he argues, the entire northern two-thirds of the subcontinent produced exactly two moderately durable region-spanning states, the Chandragupta and the Mughal. Neither of these, nor any of the smaller northern states, lasted longer than two centuries, and anarchical interregna were everywhere prolonged and severe. Owen Lattimore, <clears throat> uh, my hero, I might add, and the pioneer of border studies in the context of China's relationship with its powerful militarized nomadic fringe, sees a more general continental pattern. He points to state walls and fortifications against non-state peoples springing up from Western Europe through Central Asia to China and lasting until the Mughal invasions of Europe in the 13th century. It seems a rather extravagant claim, but coming as it does from Owen Lattimore, it merits pondering, and I'm going to quote him here. He writes, there was a linked chain of fortified northern frontiers of the ancient world from the Pacific to the Atlantic. The earliest frontier walls appear to have been in the Iranian sector, the walled frontiers of the Western Roman Empire and Britain and on the Rhine and Danube faced forest, upland, and meadow tribes, now pastoral nomads. The, gr the greatest boon that the appearance of states provided to barbarians, however, was less as sites for predation that I've so far emphasized than as trading posts. Because states represented such narrow agroecologies, that is to say, floodplains, alluvial soils, and river bottoms, uh, they relied on a host of products from outside the alluvium in order to survive. State and non-state peoples were natural trading partners. As a state grew in population and wealth, so did its, uh, did its commercial exchange with nearby barbarians. In the last millennium BC, there was a veritable explosion in seaborne commerce in the Mediterranean that exponentially increased the volume and value of the trade. The greater part of the barbarian economy in this context was devoted to supplying lowland markets with raw materials and goods that they required, much of which was in turn destined for re-export to other ports. A good part of what they supplied was livestock in the most expansive sense of the term, cattle, sheep, and above all, slaves. Uh, they also provided many of the basic metals and minerals that the states um, required. In return, they received textiles, grain, worked iron and worked copper, pottery, and artisan luxury uh, articles. Much of it, too, from international trade. Barbarian groups have controlled one or more of the major trading routes, usually a navigable river, to a major lowland center could reap huge rewards and became in turn conspicuous sites of luxury, talent, and if you will, civilization. Plunder of trade with the state then made economic life on the state's margins more viable and lucrative than it could otherwise have been. But plunder and trade were not simply alternative modes of appropriation, as we'll see. They were very effectively combined in ways that mimicked certain forms of statecraft. Now, one can characterize state ecology uh, in terms of the alluvial soils, the possibility of growing cereal grains, uh, uh, and all of this, all of the classical states, incidentally, are all grain states. That is to say, there are uh, there are no potato states, there are no cassava states, there are no chickpea states, there are no lentil states. All of the classical states are cereal grains that all ripen at the same time. Uh, millets, uh, rice, wheat, barley, uh, and maize, uh, which constitutes more than 50% of the total world consumption of calories today. So we've all been turned into parrots uh, by <laughs> this history of civilization. Um, it's much more difficult to describe barbarian ecology because it's essentially 
um, a, uh, a residual category of all of those ecologies that are not suitable for the concentration of population in cereal grains and the appropriation of surplus value from the population that lives there. Uh, the figurative and often literal limits of a state's reach was often demarcated by a physical boundary between civilized and barbarian zones. The first great wall of this kind, which is often forgotten, um, given Chinese hegemony in world history, if you like, was the 250 kilometer long wall of the land built by command of Sumerian King Sulgi around 2000 BC between the Tigris and Euphrates, your Tigris and Euphrates where uh, the distance between them is uh, it's a narrow waste of, uh, of land where the distance is at a minimum. Although it's typically described as a wall to keep out the barbarian Amorites, at which it failed, I might add, and Porter and others believe that it had the additional purpose of keeping the southern Mesopotamian tax-paying cultivators in. For the early Roman Empire, barbarians began on the east bank of the Rhine, which the Roman legions never ventured beyond after the catastrophic defeat in the Battle of Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD. It's kind of interesting to do an historical uh, account of exactly where in different times the barbarians begin. You know, the used to be said by the English aristocrats that the wogs begin at Calais, right? And then for the French, it begins at the Rhine, and uh, for the Germans, it began at the eider neisse line. Uh, and then when you get to China, the whole thing flips back, and the barbarians are uh, all, to the, uh, uh, all to the west. Uh, Barbarian and civilized zones were also often understood as forms of subsistence activity and particularly of diet as well. That is to say, it was extremely important for the Romans to understand themselves as eating a diet of grain, where as compared to the Gallic diet of meat and dairy products. The barbarians might even plant some grain and often did and eat it but grain was unlikely to be their dominant staple as it was for state projects, excuse me, state subjects. They were, by virtue of their mobility, their diverse livelihoods, and their dispersal, unsuitable raw material for appropriation or for state building. The civilizational narratives of early states imply, if they don't state directly, that some primitives, through luck or cleverness, managed to domesticate crops and animals found sedentary communities and went on from there uh, to create towns and states. They left primitivism behind for state and civilization. The barbarians on this account are the ones who didn't make the transition, those who remained outside. After this great divergence, there were two spheres, the civilized sphere of settlement, towns and states on the one hand, and the primitive sphere of mobile dispersed foragers, hunters and pastoralists. The membrane between these two spheres was permeable, but only in one direction. Primitives might enter the sphere of civilization. This was, after all, the grand narrative of being drawn to the light, to the city, and to civilization. But it was inconceivable that the civilized could ever revert to primitivism. We know now this view to be, on historical evidence, fundamentally wrong. There are long, long periods um, in which it's quite obvious that the state is disgorging subjects as uh, readily as it is absorbing subjects. Uh, periods of collapse, of epidemics, of wars, of uh, excessive corvée uh, pressure uh, often led to flight and to the collapse of states. Uh, and so the people who became the barbarians were increasingly, as the history of the state progressed, were people who had left the state area uh, by design or by the desperation of the collapse of a particular uh, state. And they were, in a sense, you could call them uh, barbarians by design. And the areas which they then uh, ended up living in, for the most part, 
were what Richard White memorably calls shatter zones, often zones of tremendous linguistic and cultural complexity because they were the non-state areas in which people fleeing the states accumulated over long periods of time, uh, and they reflected, in a sense, the fragmentation of many, many earlier states, and that, that lent a kind of complexity to these uh, shatter zones. So far from being seen as regrettable backsliding and privation, um, exit from the state may well have been experienced as a marked improvement in safety, nutrition, and social order. Becoming a barbarian was often a bid to improve one's lot. And here I quote Christopher Beckwith, who's examined this, I think, better than anyone else. He writes, and I quote, nomads were in general much better fed and led easier, longer lives than the inhabitants of the large agricultural states. There was a constant drain of peoples escaping from China to the realms of the Eastern Steppe, where they did not hesitate to proclaim the superiority of the nomad lifestyle. Similarly, many Greeks and Romans joined the Huns and other Central Eurasian peoples, where they lived better and were treated better than they had been back home. Such voluntary self-nomadization was neither rare nor isolated. For Chinese Mongol frontier, Owen Lattimore has made the case most forcefully that the purpose of the Great Walls of China were mostly to keep farming taxpayers inside the wall rather than to keep the barbarians outside the wall. Excuse me while I skipped. I want to return to the theme of raiding. Uh, after a raid by people from beyond the alluvium, a well-to-do resident of Ur, the, one of the great cities along with Uruk and Eridu and so on in the Mesopotamian alluvium, the earliest cities in the world, um, a resident of Ur wrote the following lament uh, following this raid, quote, he who came from the highland has carried my possessions back to the highlands. The swamp has swallowed my possessions. Men ignorant of silver have filled their hands with my silver. Men ignorant of gems have fastened my gems around their necks. While the density of grain population and livestock in a concentrated space is the source of a state's power, it's also, of course, the source of its potentially fatal vulnerability to mobile raiders. To be sure, the state is often no richer than its periphery, but, as we have seen, the decisive difference is that the state or any sedentary community's wealth is all conveniently stacked up in a confined space, while the wealth of the periphery is widely dispersed. Mobile raiders, especially if they're mounted, have the military initiative. They can arrive at a time and place of their choosing and in sufficient number to overwhelm the weakest point of a settled community or intercept a trading caravan. If they're numerous enough, they can take a fortified community. Their advantage lies in lightning raids. Under pre-modern conditions, and perhaps even until the era of cannons, mobile armies of pastoralists have proven superior to aristocratic and peasant armies of states. Even in regions without pastoralists and horses, the general pattern seems to be that more mobile peoples, hunters and gatherers, swidners, boat people, tend to dominate and extract tribute from sedentary horticulturalists and farmers. The well-known Berber saying that raiding is our agriculture gestures, I think, in the direction of an important truth about the parasitic quality of raiding. The granaries of a sedentary community may represent two or more years of agrarian toil that raiders can appropriate in a flash. Why would you want to spend two years growing a grain when you can just come to the granary right, and take it? Uh, penned or corralled livestock are, in the same sense, living granaries that can be confiscated. And since the booty of a raid also typically included slaves to ransom, keep, or sell, they, too, represented a concentrated store of value and productivity reared at considerable expense that could be taken away in a day. And like domesticated animals, capable of reproducing progeny for the raiding group itself. From an even broader perspective, one might say that one parasite was displacing another, 
Inasmuch as the raiders were confiscating and dispersing the accumulated assets of what had been until then a concentrated site of appropriation reserved exclusively for state elites. Barbarian raiders were, for their part, relatively safe from retaliation by the state. Being mobile and dispersed, they could simply melt away off into the hills, swamps, trackless grasslands, or the, on, on, on the water, uh, where state armies or navies followed at their peril. State armies might be effective against fixed objectives in sedentary communities, but were largely helpless campaigning against acephalous bands with no central authority. Another way of putting this, as um, Lattimore does, is that the Mongolian steppes lacked nerve centers. There was nothing in particular to capture the people who we might want to punish uh, simply could disperse successfully. If we are to believe the words that Herodotus puts in the mouth of a Scythian interlocutor, I think he's making this up, but he understands the basic ecology, I think, nomad raiders were quite conscious of the military advantage of having no fixed property. And here are the words that Herodotus gives to the Scythian. For we Scythians have no towns or planted lands that we might sooner meet thee in battle. Otherwise, we would fear that our towns be taken and our crops wasted. The same can be said for sea seaborne raiders for piracy, for the famous Orang Laut of, the, of Southeast Asia and the Sunda Shelf, for Vikings and Buccaneers. <laughs> there is, however, a deep and fundamental contradiction to raiding, which once grasped, suggests why raiding is a radically unstable mode of subsistence, one that is unlikely, uh, that is likely under most circumstances to evolve into something quite different. Carried to its logical conclusion, raiding is self-liquidating. That is to say, if you successfully take everything that passes through a strait, uh, that is to say, a water strait in which commerce goes, and you sack every boat and take everything, pretty soon the trade routes will disappear and the commerce will dry up. The same for land routes and caravans. And if you could sack a city repeatedly, the city will essentially disappear and the population of it will disperse. And you have, in that sense, uh, killed the goose that lays the golden egg. Um, so generally what happens over time is that uh, raiders establish, it's rather the way germs become endemic in a population uh, in terms of disease. Um, what happens is that raiders establish a stable equilibrium with the parasite and the host to establish a stable equilibrium in which the raiders collect a toll in return for protecting the trade. Every boat that sails through the state that passes on this trade route uh, will be taxed um, and, the, uh, and, and tribute will be uh, exacted from them. And so here we have commerce being regularly taxed um, from my anarchist perspective, that looks pretty much like a state already, um, which is, uh, as Charles Tilley has argued, is a protection racket in any case. Um, and uh, the, and in fact, this protection racket became in the Tang Dynasty a huge uh, drain on the Chinese treasury in terms of silk and so on that were given to the barbarians in order not to raid. Uh, the process is something that is, uh, some colleagues of mine in political science who I'm occasionally listen to, uh, call uh, throffers, uh, which is the combination of a threat with an offer, or in a <laughs> mafioso style, an offer you can't refuse. If we step back and widen the lens, barbarian state relations can be seen as a contest between two parties for the right to appropriate surplus from sedentary grain and manpower modules. It's this module that is the basis for state formation and equally essential to barbarian accumulation. It is the prize. One-time plunder raiding is likely to kill the host altogether, while a stable protection racket, racket mimics the process of state appropriation and is compatible with the long-run productivity of the grain core. 
The earliest substantial communities were already dependent on trade and exchange with other ecological zones. The consolidation of larger states only increased this dependence. Given the early constraints on transportation, the juxtaposition, uh, excuse me, the juxtaposition in Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent of high plateau, intramontane valleys, Piedmont steppe, and alluvium, along with navigable water, made possible a kind of vertical economy of beneficial exchange, or an Uruk, were possible only by virtue of the products from higher altitudes, stone, ore, oils, timber, limestone, soapstone, silver, lead, copper, uh, grindstones, gemstones, uh, gold, and not least, slaves and captives. Most of these products were floated down water courses. The longer and more navigable the river, the larger the potential polity. Smaller Mediterranean polities were miniature replicas of this, as near as I can tell. They were typically located on the alluvium of a river near to the coast and adjacent uplands and could thereby command trade and exchange for the whole watershed. These are watershed polities, if you like, on the order of, uh, of the Hulu Helier uh, uh, classical Malay states. This combination was favored over time thanks to its unrivaled ability to harness <coughs> and integrate the food mobilizing and wealth acquiring openings of both land and sea. The barbarian stars, as I've called them, best known to history, were no different in kind than earlier and smaller non-state peoples, hunters and gatherers, swiddeners, coastal foragers and herdsmen, who raided small states and also traded with them. What was unique was the unprecedented magnification of scale of the confederations of mounted warriors, of the wealth of lowland states, which was much greater, and of the volume and reach of trade. The emphasis on raiding in most histories is understandable in view of the terror it evoked among the elites of the threatened states, who, after all, provide us with the written sources for the most part. This perspective overlooks the centrality of trade and the degree to which raiding was often a means rather than an end itself. Again, I quote Christopher Beckwith, who I think is instructive on this. He writes, Chinese, Greek, and Arab historical sources agree that the steppe peoples were above all interested in trade. The careful manner in which Central Eurasians generally undertook their conquests is revealing. They attempted to avoid conflict and tried to get cities to submit peacefully. Only when they resisted or rebelled was retribution necessary. The Central Eurasians' conquests were designed to acquire trade routes and to acquire trading cities. But the reason for the acquisition was to secure occupied territory that could then be taxed in order to pay for the ruler's socio-political infrastructure. If all this sounds exactly like what a sedentary peripheral state was doing itself, it's because it was in fact the same thing. The early agrarian states and the barbarian polities had broadly similar aims. Both sought to dominate the grain and manpower core with its surplus. Both sought to dominate the trade that was within reach. Both were slaving and raiding states in which the major booty of war and major commodity and trade were human beings. It's hard, I don't have time this evening to emphasize the fact that all early states were uh, slave states and slaving states. Uh, including Mesopotamia, in which it's uh, sometimes uh, disputed. In this respect, they were competing protection rackets. The linkage between raiding and trading is reflected in the Celtic fringe of the Roman Empire, especially in Gaul. In Republican Rome, the Celts, as noted, were often paid off in gold for not raiding. Over time, the Celtic towns, the Opida, became, in effect, multi-ethnic trading posts along river routes to the empire dominating trade in that sector. In return for grain, oil, wine, fine cloth, and prestige goods, they might send raw materials, woolens, leather, salt pork, trained dogs, and cheeses to the Romans. The potential rewards for dominating land and waterborne trade expanded exponentially as the trade itself expanded. Trade over long distances was hardly new, even before the Neolithic valued commodities so long as they were small and light were exchanged over great distances like obsidian and semi-precious stones and gold and carnelian beads. What was new was not so much the range of trade but the fact that it had become 
uh, come increasingly to include bulk commodities moved over much longer distances. Egypt became the breadbasket of the Western Mediterranean, shipping grain to Greece and later to Rome. What's crucial as well is that the market for goods that were raised, grown, and foraged outside the agrarian core had an exponentially larger potential market. Goods from the mountains, the high plateaus, the marine fringes and marshes that might previously have only circulated locally were now traded worldwide. For example, beeswax, aromatic wood such as camphor wood and sandalwood, as well as uh, resins such as uh, aromatic resins such as frankincense and myrrh were much prized. It would be hard to overemphasize the importance of this transformation. Suddenly, the periphery, the semi-periphery of early states were sites of valuable commodities for which there was now a worldwide market. Foraging, hunting, and marine collecting became lucrative commercial activities. It's said that before the end of the first millennium AD that Borneo was uh, almost unoccupied and that it became occupied because of the Chinese luxury market and uh, people from all over the Indonesian archipelago realized that it was an incredibly valuable place for foraging the products that could be taken to the coast uh, and uh, which would then enter world trade and that's why one finds dongsan drums and luxury goods way up in the Bornean uh, highlands and that it was if you like um, these people ought not to be con these people ought to be considered commercial traders waiting for their main chance, not sort of subsistence farmers, uh, that this was, in a sense, the commercial exploitation that was responsible in large part for the peopling of, uh, of Borneo. Think, for example, of the way in which the ivory trade made commodities enormously valuable that were previously only circulated locally. The beaver pelts and how it transformed relations among Native Americans. Uh, um, today, uh, the uh, the trade in ginseng uh, root, in caterpillar fungus, and matsutake mushrooms, things that are uh, wild foraged and have this now tremendous value. If you get fresh matsutake in, um, in basically 48 hours on a high-end plate in, uh, in Tokyo, uh, a um, uh, Yakuza gangster boss uh, will be able to please his girlfriend or his uh, boss with a $1,500 plate of matsutake mushrooms. Uh, this was not available uh, uh, traditionally. Central Asia, uh, Central Eurasia, had a wealth of products to trade for goods from the Iberian states, especially when shipping open distance market, distant markets. Beckwith provides an extensive list of such products traded by early travelers. The list is enormous, but an abbreviated uh, list will give you some sense of its variety. Copper, iron, horses, mules, furs, hides, wax, amber, swords, armor, fabrics, cotton, uh, which could also be in the low rounds as well, but wool, um, uh, wool carpets, Blanket cloth, felt, tents, stirrups, bows, fine woods, linseed, nuts, and never absent from the list, slaves. So what was, it really always is important to realize that among the, among the major commodity being gathered in the hills were slaves. Um, raiding by nomadic groups, which resembled warfare by agrarian states, is best understood as a means of acquiring tributary communities, as I've mentioned, and dominating the trade that circulated through them. It was not a result of nomadic poverty, still less a desire for shiny objects. All nomadic societies were complex in the sense that they practiced some agriculture as well as herding and had a substantial artisan class. One has to just look at the court of Genghis Khan. So that they were not normally in need of staple cereals or technical expertise from agrarian states. The barbarians broadly understood were perhaps uniquely positioned to take advantage, in many cases direct charge, of the explosion in trade. They were, after all, by virtue of their mobility and dispersion across several ecological zones, the commercial connective tissue between the various sedentary serial intensive states. As trade grew, 
mobile non-state peoples were able to dominate the arteries, uh, arteries and capillaries of this trade and exact tribute for doing so. Uh, I think of these states and their uh, parasitic nomadic peoples as dark twins. Uh, state and non-state peoples uh, are dark twins both in reality and semiotically. Each member of the pair conjures up its partner and despite abundant historical evidence to the contrary, the people who have historically identified themselves as belonging to the ostensibly more evolved member of this pair, that is to say, state people, agriculturalists, the civilized, they've taken their identity as essential, permanent, and superior. The most tendentious of these pairs, the civilized barbarian pair, are born together as twins. Lattimore has articulated this dark twin thesis most clearly, I think. He writes, and I quote, not only the frontier between civilization and barbarism, but barbarian societies themselves were in large measure created by the growth and geographical spread of the great ancient civilizations. It is proper to speak of the barbarians as primitive only in that remote time when no civilization yet existed and when the forebears of civilized peoples were also primitive. From the moment civilization began to evolve, it recruited into civilization some of the peoples who had land and displaced others, and the effect on those who were displaced was that they modified their own economic practices and experimented with new kinds of specialization, that they also, and they also evolved new forms of social cohesion and political organization and new ways of fighting. Civilization itself created its own barbarian plague. Although Lattimore or ignores the millions of non-state foragers, Swidners, marine cultivators, he concentrates on pastoralists, uh, given the area that he specialized in, uh, he does capture the parallel evolution of nomadism in states. These nomads, most especially those on horseback who plagued state centers, are best seen simply as the strongest <coughs> competitors of the state for control over the agrarian surplus. Hunters and gatherers or Swidners might nibble at the state when politically mobilized in large confederations, nomads were a kind of state in waiting, or as Thomas Barfield puts it, a shadow empire. The relationship between nomadic periphery and adjacent state could take any number of forms and was in any case highly volatile. At the predatory end, it might consist of occasional raids punctuated by retaliatory expeditions by state armies. Caesar's, Caesar's brutal campaigns in Gaul might be considered a rare example of a successful expedition that despite many subsequent uprisings extended Roman rule. It's estimated that a, a million Gauls were um, uh, killed in the process of Caesar's conquest, most of them by uh, Gallic mercenary troops, as I'll get to. Uh, in other cases, such as Xiangnu, Uyghurs, and Huns, the relationship might involve bribes, subsidies, and a kind of reverse tribute. Such arrangements under which barbarians receive part of the proceeds of the sedentary grain complex in return for not raiding ought to be thought of, I think, as a kind of de, de facto joint sovereignty by state and barbarians. Under relatively stable conditions, such an equilibrium might approximate the frontier protection racket I described earlier. Conditions, however, were rarely so stable, either with respect to statecraft or with respect to the other fragmented, fractious, uh, nomadic polities. Two other solutions were possible, each of which, in effect, dissolved the dichotomy itself. The first, of course, was the, for the nomadic barbarians to conquer the state or empire and become the new ruling class. Such was the case at least twice in China's history with the Yuan and uh, <coughs> Qing or Manchu dynasties. Also the case with Osman, uh, founder of the Ottoman Empire. As the Chinese proverb has it, you can conquer a kingdom on horseback, but to rule it, you have to get off the horse. The second alternative is far more common, but much less remarked upon. And that is for nomads to become the cavalry and mercenaries of the state, patrolling the marches and keeping the other barbarians in check. Uh, 
In fact, it's the very rare state or empire that has not recruited units from among the barbarians, often in return for trade and privilege and local autonomy. Caesar's pacification of Gaul was accomplished largely with Gallic troops. And I think understand, I understand that the Scots were basically uh, conquered by Welsh troops. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly the case. Um, in this case, rather than conquering the state, the barbarians became part of the military arm of an existing state along the line, say, of the Cossacks or the Gurkhas. This pattern in the colonial setting has been called indigenous sub-imperialism. On a large scale, the use of mercenaries poses its own risks for a sedentary state, as the Tang decided when they, in effect, hired the Turkic Uyghurs to, pre to suppress the huge An Lushan rebellion. The consensus among most barbarian specialists, I guess I could consider myself now to be a barbarian specialist, um, seems to be that nomadic pastoralists require sedentary communities as a depot of manpower and revenue, as well as a trading outlet. Nomadic pastoralists have been known to forcibly resettle agrarian populations in order to create such depots. Founders of civilizations, you come here, you plant crops, and we'll be by every year to take our tax, thank you. Uh, further, they contend that barbarian confederations operate as shadow empires adjacent to and parasitic on large sedentary policy, uh, polities. Their quasi-derivative status is emphasized by the fact that they tend to disappear when their host collapses. Among the pairs that rise and fall together um, might be included the Xiangnu and the Han, the Turkish Kaganat and the Tang, the Huns and the Romans, the Sea People and the Egyptians, and perhaps the Amorites and the Mesopotamian city-states. Presumably, the Yuan and Manchu dynasties did not count in the series as they swallowed the sedentary kingdom rather than disappearing. It's all too characteristic, though no less deplorable, that much ink is devoted to the barbarian states and empires they bedeviled. Like a capital city that dominates the news, they dominate the historical coverage. A more even-handed history would be able to chronicle the relationship of hundreds of smaller states with thousands of nearby non-state peoples, not to mention the relationship of predation and alliance between non-state peoples. In his account of Athens and the Peloponnesian Wars, for example, Thucydides discusses dozens and dozens of different hill and valley peoples, those with kings, those without kings, those with whom Athens has relations of alliances, tribute, or enmity. Each of these pairs were their own, have their own histories. They had added immeasurably to our understanding of the relationship between states and their non-state neighbors. To close, I want to make the case for the Golden Age briefly. Uh, there is, I believe, a long period, measured, as I said, not in centuries but in millennia, between the earliest appearance of states and lasting until perhaps only four centuries ago that might be called the Golden Age of Barbarians, and for non-state peoples in general. For much of this long epoch, the political enclosure movement represented by a modern nation state did not yet exist. Physical movement, flux, and open frontier, and mixed subsistence strategies were the hallmark of this entire period. Even the exceptional and short-lived empires of this long epoch, the, the Roman, the Han, the Ming, and, and the New World, the Mayan peer polities, and the Inca, could not impede large-scale population movements in and out of their political orbit. While the increase in population would have by itself encouraged more intensive subsistence strategies, the fragility of the state, its exposure to epidemics, and large non-state peripheries would not have allowed us to discern anything like a state hegemony until around perhaps 1600 AD. Until then, a very large share of the world's population had never seen a routine tax collector, or if they had seen one, they still had the option of making themselves scarce. There's no particular need to insist on this quasi-arbitrary date. It roughly marks the end of the great Eurasian barbarian waves, the seaborne Vikings from the 8th to the 11th centuries, Tamerlane's great kingdom of the late 14th century, and the conquest of Osman and his immediate successors. Between them, they destroyed, plundered, and conquered hundreds of polities, large and small, and displaced millions of people. They were also great slaving expeditions. Among the major prizes of such campaigns were precious metals and human beings for sale. 
It's not so much that such raiding mixed with trade disappeared after 1600 um, as that it became more fragmented and smaller in scale. Edward Gibbon, a comparatively rare voice with something good to say on behalf of pagans, wondered whether there were any barbarians left in Europe in the late 18th century. From, from my perspective, he might have considered the Barbary pirates, Macedonia, the Highland Scots, or he might actually have noticed that the Europeans had joined the Arabs in scouring the African continent for slaves. Uh, predation was still going on. It was just at a different level. Outside Europe and the Mediterranean, the pattern of raiding, trading, and slaving remained a major activity in the Malay world and upland Southeast Asia among hill peoples. People in northern Thailand and Orang Asli in Malaysia can remember their grandparents talking about running away from slave raids uh, today. Um, as states and durable gunpowder regimes grew, the ability of non-state peoples to raid and dominate small states shrank at a pace that depended greatly on the region and the geography. The earlier states, because earliest states, because of their opportunities they opened for trade, supplemented by raiding and protection rackets, represented a qualitatively new environment for non-state peoples. Now, a good deal of the world around them was valuable. They could participate fully in the new opportunities for trade without becoming a subject of the state. There would have been periods when leaving behind the plow of the state subject to take up foraging, pastoralism, and marine collecting would have represented a rational economic calculation as well as a bolt for freedom. Many of the things that archaeologists call the collapse of a traditional civilization is actually a redistribution, I think, of population because of disease or political collapse at the apex. And because there are not a lot of uh, stones atop stones and a populated center that can be represented in the British Museum around the corner, uh, it's seen as the collapse of everything that's valuable. In such moments, it's likely that the proportion of barbarians vis-a-vis -vis state subjects would have grown because life at the periphery had become more, not less attractive. Life of late barbarians would, on balance, have been rather good. Their subsistence was still spread across several food webs being dispersed. They would have been less vulnerable to the failures of a single food source. They were more likely to be healthier and live longer, especially if they were female, because the grain center was uh, created high rates of mortality, particularly uh, for women. More advantageous, more advantageous trade made for more leisure, thus further widening the leisure drudgery ratio between foragers and farmers. Finally, and by no means trivial, barbarians were not subordinated or domesticated to the hierarchical social order of sedentary agriculture in the state. They were, in almost every respect, freer than the celebrated yeoman farmer. It's not a bad balance sheet for a class of barbarians over whom the waves of history were supposed to have uh, rolled several uh, uh, long ago. There are, however, and in closing, two deeply melancholy aspects of the golden age of barbarians. They have each directly to do with the ecologically given political fragmentation of barbarian life. As I said, many of the trade goods brought to the trading states were, of course, other non-state peoples who could be sold into bondage at the state core. This is a story in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and elsewhere. So perverse and pervasive was this practice in mainland Southeast Asia that one can identify something like a chain of predation in which more strategically located and powerful groups raided weaker and more dispersed neighbors. In doing so, they reinforced the state core at the expense of their fellow barbarians. A second melancholy aspect of the new livelihoods at the periphery afforded by states was, as I noted, the sale of their martial skills to states as mercenaries. One would be hard put to find an early state that didn't enlist non-state people, sometimes wholesale, in their armies to catch runaway slaves, to repress revolts among their own restive population. Barba this is a practice also taken up by colonial regimes, I might add. Barbarian levies had as much to do with building states as to plundering them. By systematically replenishing the state's manpower base by slaving and by protecting and expanding the state with its military services, the barbarians quite willingly dug their own grave. Thank you.
So we have uh, some time for questions, if there are any. There's uh, two microphones. Any, any takers? Yeah, there's, there's one down here. Right there. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, thank you very much. It helped uh, me think through many issues in uh, Indian history. I had a couple of quick questions. Uh, reading against the grain, would you um, say that um, you now see the state in a more sympathetic light than uh, you did in some of your earlier work? Um, say that again, please. The last sentence. Do you see the state, or do you see the implication of what you've argued as um, s rendering the state, seeing the state in a more sympathetic light than, uh, than uh, has been the case in some of your earlier work? Um, so that's the first uh, question. Um, the second is uh, with regard to the barbarian civilized distinction, which, which is very interesting, uh, but certainly, um, is, I mean, it's, it's been sort of well known in many um, historical circles, certainly of South Asian historians and elsewhere, that, uh, that uh, the, more, the more barbaric, uh, if you like, uh, regime has replaced uh, the more, a more civil, or has conquered a more civilized peoples because, um, yeah, because uh, the complexity and the agility uh, that barbarians have isn't, isn't matched uh, by uh, yeah, by the more civilized. So my second question was what you see the talk today as uh, contributing to uh, in our understanding uh, of the long durée of history as being a supplanting of uh, more civilized uh, regimes by more barbaric uh, ones. Okay, thank you. There's, there's a question down there. Second from the front, second row from the front. No, 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 right there, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this extremely thought-provoking um, talk. Um, barbarians sound like they're having great fun. Uh, and we would all like to be barbarians if we have the chance, perhaps, or some of us. Uh, but the question is, you've, I think, must be in, in the writing and uh, you've would have touched on that. The question is, had to do with weapons, weaponry, martial arts, and so on. And so, modes of violence uh, and the kind of um, capacities, skills, and so on. And you know, in your presentation, are these static? Uh, how do they change? And in their change, then you know, um, barbarians as well do change. What, what happens to barbarians when these capacities? Uh, these skills and, and, and so on. Uh, but there, there was the other thing that you talked about towards the end, which is barbarians becoming mercenaries. And you didn't really touch on the normative dimensions. The fact that they can stay the barbarians for a long time must be based on uncertain norms, codes of honor and so on. And what changes for them to become civilized but really barbarians? Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Professor Scott. I think one of the most interesting things about your speeches and your books is the counterintuitive idea that life under the nation state may not be all that it's all that people think it is. And, and here, I think you've implied that. And plausibly, that under the age of barbarians, for many people, it was better off living in a stateless condition. I was just wondering what you might make of the thesis that people like Steven Pinker have put forth that, well, isn't it great now we live under states and it's a lot more peaceful that apparently critical science has found that people die a lot less and... So, I, I, just as a kind of devil's advocate, I, I think Pinker would say, well, this is all very well and nice, but Bill, we're dying in droves, and now we live in a much more peaceful state-led age. I was just wondering what your response to the, I, the Pinker I, I, thesis I might be. Okay. 
I, I'm in danger of losing track of all the things that have been put on the table, so I'd like to take up some of this anyway. Um, the, the general comment I wanted to make about the first two questions is that uh, I, I've obviously failed. I wanted to destroy the barbarian civilized right, uh, uh, dichotomy and uh, propose that these are two political formations vying for control of the grain manpower module uh, over time and that barbarian life represented actually a quite uh, well to do in its stable form, barbarian life with all of the comforts of an artisan class and wealth uh, and so on, without the inconveniences of uh, uh, taxes and corvée and the burdens of being uh, a state. Now, uh, I, think I missed that. I understood that very well. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I lost my I lost my head. It won't happen again. Uh, the uh, let me, uh, I, I don't want to start in on Steven Pinker and I, 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 um, I reject his argument, uh, <laughs> more or less wholesale. wholesale. And, and uh, I mean, since it coincides actually with an argument made actually less carefully uh, and more negligently by Jared Diamond uh, in the world until yesterday, uh, it seems to me that what it fails to take into account uh, is the fact that the first sedentary communities were at the same time the birthplace for all of the zoonotic infectious diseases and the uh, rates of mortality because of crowding. And by crowding, I mean not just the crowding of human beings, because uh, these are called density-dependent diseases or community acute infections in the public health parlance, but it was also a crowding of domesticated animals and most of the infectious diseases are zoonotic diseases that move between domesticated animals and human beings. And these diseases did not exist at all before the crowding uh, of, the late, of the late Neolithic. So the point is that the, the early period of uh, the first sedentary communities of Ur and Uruk that had 25,000 perhaps uh, uh, people, these, uh, the rates of mortality were huge. And so I think a lot of the collapse of these uh, areas uh, was large. The other difference is that <clears throat> I, I don't want to make a case for peaceful, happy, communal, barbarian life. Uh, it riven with feuds and internecine warfare, but I think it's indisputable that in hunter and gathering societies, the kind of wars, tend to be brief, episodic, the losers move out, move away, and it's only when you get large sedentary kingdoms that you get standing armies, right, and you get sort of large-scale warfare uh, of, a major, of, a, of a major kind, and I think uh, Steven Pinker misses this. And uh, the idea of taking the fact when you find a number of people who've been executed, right, and you then uh, try to do a statistical analysis of pre-Neolithic life. Uh, the, the, the statistical assumptions that you have to do to get there uh, from the data he has uh, are not right. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> he, he takes my breath away. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, on the question of, of, of weapons, I, my impression is that the military advantages of mobile non-state people over sedentary communities has to do with mobility and not with arms, right? Um, that is to say, the, until quite late in the game, the technology, uh, I mean, other things equal, uh, a, a sedentary state against another sedentary state, the sedentary state with the larger number of people almost always wins, right? Because the Technology of warfare is pretty much right equal, uh, and it depends um, to a great extent uh, on on manpower. So it's the mobility of barbarians to concentrate the manpower that they have and the weapons that they do have, which are no different or superior to the ones of sedentary communities. And that's so you can see this happening. You know, it's when the sort of reinforced walls start appearing. Right? Uh, it's complicated because.
I began thinking of all these walls as a way of the way, I mean, if, if there's a wall, there's something that people want to protect behind it, right? Uh, and it turns out that many of these walls actually were walls against floods and the siltation that the very early sedentary communities uh, created, and they weren't all defensive walls to protect stores of grain or valuable uh, silver and commodities and so on. Um, the, um, I'm, um, I'm not sure I answered your question. I don't think I did. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, uh, oh, actually, it's not my job to like the state or not like it. Uh, or uh, it's my job to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, and, you know, if uh, I, I do live in, right, an uh, uh, agrarian state. Uh, and so it's uh, quite a part, but my, my, my job is to kind of partly to understand a narrative of civilization and history that is so state-centric and so written from the large accumulations of population, the sedentary agrarian centers, that it seems, so I think it is extremely important to realize that for a huge period of human history, the emptying out of these cities uh, and the so-called collapse of ancient civilizations, unless it was by disease, uh, that in many cases, this resulted in an improvement in human welfare, in a redistribution of population, people uh, getting away from corvée and taxes and warfare and conscription and so on. So to the idea to think that a decrease in complexity and a movement to the non-state sort of periphery is a return to uh, you know, living hand to mouth, uh, it's insane. It, I mean, it's just, I think, palpably and demonstrably wrong. Uh, and so that a collapse of one of these centers has to be looked at carefully and empirically. I don't want to, to um, think I can characterize all of them myself, but it's clear to me that they are seen as lamentable declines in civilization, uh, and I think if you take, what do we know about the famous dark age of Greece from 1100 to 700 uh, BC? Well, it's the period when the Iliad and the Odyssey became the great oral epics uh, of Greece. Most of the major centers appeared, there appears to have been some warfare and burned, and burned cities. How many people died? Who knows, maybe it was just a redistribution of population. Uh, we don't know. I, it just seems to me that the dark age, right, means that we don't have things to put in the British Museum uh, from that period, and isn't that a shame? Uh, and we ought to sort of look at it with a kind of wider eye, that's all. Oh, sure. All right, so there's one down there. There's two down there. John Sardell from here. Um, for much of the talk, you uh, stayed within a kind of equilibrium model, as it were. Um, and then, sort of, the, in terms of a kind of historical development, uh, right. you, it was truncated around the time when the world capitalist economy or the military revolution or the gunpowder revolution takes off. But you also mentioned, among various people, someone who's more familiar to most people here than some of the other scholars you mentioned, namely Charles Tilley. And I just wonder whether part of what we should take away from your account is uh, an alternative or complementary understanding of you know, what he and others would call state formation, in which that unacknowledged dark twin, um, you know, the uncle no one wants to talk about, you know, is, is there in the story that it's not just that states make states, um, but it's that barbarians make states. And that alongside the equilibrium model, you've suggested in a variety of ways how the tools of statecraft were developed in this kind of dialectic, uh, you know, this relationship, the condominium uh, with the barbarians. I, I, I would endorse that. I mean, there's something to be said, although I don't say it in the talk. 
Uh, something to be said to when the barbarians, let's say the Yuan or the Manchu or Osman, when they actually conquer a large sedentary population and become rulers in their own right, uh, they actually often have to invent a kind of form of rule that accommodates cultural differences uh, that they did not have to accommodate, if you like, in their heartland, right? And so I think it's often empires like that, those are nomadic empires, who invent forms of indirect rule and cultural toleration. I, I haven't, but it, that seems to me to be um, to be reasonably important, and I think the the, re the reason I invoke Tilly is that uh, Tilly has this actually quite famous article uh, late in his career called "Is it Government or the State as a Protection Racket?" Um, and he made essentially this same relationship. So it, it seems to me that the, my guide in the way in which this changes, and I'm not sure how you would date it, but Ian Hacking's work on the discovery of probability and the taming of chance, his, his argument that it's, it's like in the ninth, late 18th, 19th century where the state sees its job as the improvement of the human population in its care, uh, whether preventing accidents or, I mean, the sort of beginning of the germ of a kind of welfare state. Uh, and, and much of it is to make sure that we have healthy people who can fight, right? Uh, our wars and so on. So that kind of moment at which the job of the state moves away from extraction to the idea that it's uh, a major objective of the statecraft is to improve the health, well-being, satisfaction, and so on. Right, the, what is it called? Social well-being index, uh, and so, but that's a rather that's rather late in the game, uh, and we're not talking about the state until at least 18th century, I think, in terms of uh, uh, the understanding of what statecraft is all about. Um. Thank you. Actually, the question relates partly to what you were just saying about the difference between early states and states in the last couple of hundred years. And the question is really, um, has the work that you've been doing recently made modern states look more weird or less weird um, in the sense that social science is premised on the idea that modernity is some kind of distinctive rupture and that what we're doing when we're doing social science is some kind of study of the modern. So in that sense... Um, all of these interesting questions about the relationships between states and populations are opened up, but does looking backwards make, if you like, the high modernism that you've explored in, in right. earlier work look very distinctive or actually something that states were always kind of doing? That, that's a job I'd be happy to turn over for, to someone else to figure out. Uh, in, 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 the, in the sense that it does. So I did ask myself, how come, so, Homo sapiens has been around for 200,000 years. The last 50,000 years uh, out of Africa, by and large. Uh, and the first states, just as tiny little dots on the horizon, appear maybe 6,000, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, about 4,000 BC, you can say, okay, these might be states, right? That's really kind of late in the game. And so, and, and by the way, Towns exist long before states. Domesticated crops exist long before, at least 4,000 years. And so the question is, the, uh, the old narrative is that, oh my God, once we could domesticate plants, uh, we couldn't wait to settle down. I mean, there's the, the, the narrative is the, the purpose of plants, finally, we were, we, we were tired of wandering the world and finally we uh, domesticated. Uh, and now, it, that's it also insane in the sense that how many brutal struggles have been fought to force people who are mobile to settle down, right, at the point of a gun, Native Americans uh, among them in the reservations uh, and so on. So the, the kind of assumption that the sedentary community is something that Homo sapiens always secretly longed for and that certain technical uh, advances like domestication of plants and animals made this possible seems to me to be not correct, but it does seem to me, I've, I've wondered a bit, but I think, 
part of my question was, isn't it strange that we came to live in great heaps of people and crops, right, and domesticated animals and governed by these strange institutions that we call states? And now, today, the nation state, it's like a traveling module and the IMF and the World Bank and the WHO and the UN are busy codifying standard sets of laws and currency regulations and property rules and land titling and so on in order to create a kind of standardized nation state module. Uh, and that's weird uh, in the sense that is that the only form of human political community that we can come up with? Well, how that's pathetic. <laughs> yeah, very brief comment and two questions. Uh, comment is, I, I, Jim's work always struck me as anarchist in its sensibility. I think it's just that more recently he's been more explicit about that in how he's titled his books. Um, two questions. One is this extraordinary symbiosis of early agrarian states and barbarians that you, you've suggested, very, very richly so. But the agrarian states clearly have a class structure, and that class structure is based on production and the ability to appropriate surplus labor, as you said. And are we to infer that the barbarians don't have a class structure? If so, is that, does that play its own part in this symbiosis? That's my first question. Second question is, um, have there been uh, densely populated grain producing societies in the kind of ecological conditions you outlined without states or that have survived the demise of states. I'm just sorry. The last one. The last question. That have survived the 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 collapse oh. of states. I mean, I, seems oh, I to see. me. Uh, well, that's suggested to me as well by your incredible historical sweep. Whether you think that's the case. Um, so. Let me take the last question first of, of agrarian communities that survived the collapse of the state. Uh, they're agrarian communities that predate right, the state uh, as well, and they're agrarian communities that um, uh, uh, survive uh, the collapse of the state. The, the problem is that in the Southeast Asian context, which I'm most familiar, is that when a state collapses, First of all, the population is likely to disperse of its own volition uh, to some considerable extent. And the people who are left uh, are actually the most exposed uh, to raiding of their crops or of their persons. And so it's common after a, a, a kingdom falls in Southeast Asia for all kinds of groups to sweep in and uh, vacuum up the remaining population uh, as slaves to be traded to other states and so on. That's how people kind of, that's, why, that's how most of these states get to be kind of multi-ethnic over a long periods of time in an interesting way. Uh, what, what is interesting is that because the ecology of rich alluvial soil that is very productive these are good places to be if you're not subject to raiding. And so they are places where another state is likely to grow up over time, right? So these are, if, like, if you like, state formation ecologies, uh, and you often get the foundation of a new state a generation later, uh, uh, partly because it's such a favorable place in the trade routes uh, of alluvial soils that rich. I mean, because the first agriculture ever practiced no self-respecting hunter-gatherer would ever stoop to a plow, which is tremendous drudgery and work. So the first agriculture that you get in the ancient world is flood retreat agriculture in which the floods bring you the nutritious soil, they kill all the competing weeds, they give you this sort of perfectly harrowed field, uh, they do the work of fire and swindling, if you like, and you just have to scatter seeds. Uh, um, exaggerating a little bit, but there's, it, it is the only, in terms of return per unit of labor, it's the only kind of agriculture 
that is at all competitive with uh, hunting and gathering in, in this world. With a question, uh, barbarian communities are definitely stratified uh, and in, in, in kind of interesting ways. What's interesting, however, is that these tend not to be property relations that can be inherited as a class system that perdures uh, any particular um, you know, hegemony by a particular lineage or a fraction of a tribe over time. So there are differences, but they tend to be differences that are not kind of rooted in 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 permanent property uh, differences. So they're not, uh, yeah, they're not passed on as a as a kind of structure. Uh, and 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 I think um, that's actually. I mean, it, there's no secret to why if you're a good artisan and you're a scribe and uh, you're the elites of these early agrarian states, why this would be a cool thing to be in the agrarian state. The only, the only question arises is if you're a cultivator at the bottom of the heap, right? Uh, what the advantages are for you of being in this state. And that depends, you know, on a whole series of conditions and over time is likely to fluctuate. Just, um, I mean, a, an interstate war and the Mesopotamian. So Mesopotamia is, by the way, at the period, the Uruk period is a, a the term that they use technically is pure polities, rather like Greece, a whole bunch of polities of about the same size of sharing a kind of culture and competing among themselves, their little confederations among them from time to time. And and when those they those cities went to war with one another, they, they were rather, rather small, but they had to mobilize all the resources that they could possibly um, mobilize, and that meant uh, corvée, extra grain, uh, and people kind of running away. And so, you know, the kind of Athenian coalition, after they were beaten by Sparta, just sort of fell apart. Um, and so uh, it, it, the war was created all these pressures on the core population. Uh, epidemics might do the same thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and by epidemics, I'm going on longer than I wanted to, but I, I do want to insist that the epidemics we're talking about are not, the diseases of crowding are not just homo sapiens diseases of crowding, but crops. That is to say, for the first time, you have crops of genetic similarity also crowded in the same way. This is also a kind of epidemiologically ideal for crop diseases, and the same for domesticated animals. So the crowding is a phenomenon that ha you, you have to think of the early domus as this huge pilgrimage of plants and animals, domesticated animals and human beings creating a completely new landscape, disturbing the soil, and not just the things that we domesticate, but the things that say, hey, this is a nice place to hang out. Um, so rats and mice and sparrow, I mean, all the sort of uninvited commensals that come to the domus because it's a good place, and they bring their parasites, uh, their fleas, their ticks, uh, and so on. So you have to see this as a huge, completely artificial and totally new in-gathering of uh, a, a, a totally artificial ecology that actually is very fragile, partly because it uh, has to be defended against nature more or less constantly. We have to room upstairs only till eight, so maybe we have time for one last question, quick one, maybe, yeah, yeah, please. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, you're talking about a lot, and I found it fascinating, the relationship between agrarian states and, and, the, and the surrounding barbarians. Um, and, the, and the relationship was like raiding and protection rackets. What, what part did migration and immigration of barbarians into the agrarian states play and are there any parallels that you see with what is going on now with um, mass migration? Okay. Well, the last part of that question opens out to a huge question, I suppose, right? Uh, the, so my, I don't want 
to f to flatter it with the idea of calling it a model, but the um, uh, the my idea of the relationship between the barbarian periphery and states is that there are people moving in both directions over time, uh, and so and I think one way of seeing it in the early period is that people have a whole series of subsistence uh, options, a portfolio, if you like, if you put it in sort of neoliberal terms, um, that uh, they uh, can vary the kind of subsistence that they practice depending on the distance they want to place between themselves uh, and, and the state. And so when you have peaceful trade and commerce, uh, uh, a, a good crops, there are barbarians moving in all the time uh, for the trading opportunities, uh, who may stay, who may uh, culturate and assimilate. And you also have, which I don't think anyone has ever kind of worked out in terms of culturally, you know, 70% of the population of Athens are slaves. Uh, what That has to kind of change the uh, cultural, uh, and, and many of these are uh, barbarian women who married Athenians uh, and sort of nannies who are raising children as well, not to mention the chain gangs and the silver mines and so on. So all of these states have a huge slave population and in those, uh, in the places that I'm familiar with, uh, the, there are slaves always coming in at the bottom but in the Malay world, you could be captured as a slave, and in 15 years, you might be running your own slave expeditions, right, uh, by boat. So it is, it's a slave society, and it remains a slave society because slaves are being brought in always at the bottom, but it's also a rapid upward mobility uh, society as well, in which people become assimilated quite quickly within, certainly within two generations, uh, and no particular problem, and because these are manpower starved. Same is true for Native Americans, actually. They captured people from other tribes and also uh, Euro uh, Europeans when they could and so on and would integrate them very quickly into the community. So uh, that, it seems to me that the importance of slaves and assimilation of people from without that would have me look at these societies as being more interesting and less coherent cultural cultural sites than I think I used to think of them. I mean, if 9,000 of the, of the 45,000 people in Uruk who are weaving uh, are, I mean, so the 9,000 of the total population of 45,000 in Uruk are weavers who are mostly all slaves and who are integrated into the society, 20, 30% of the population. Uh, what does this do for what Uruk culture uh, looks like over time? And these are barbarians from the hills. The word for slave in Mesopotamia is the combination of the word of the of the hieroglyph for mountain and woman, right? Is this kind of standard term for, for slave. And so uh, now, my impression is that we have vastly, vastly understated the degree to which people have been moved around voluntarily and by force and by wars and incursions in store, in deep in history. Uh, and I, uh, I would like to see someone figure that out, right? Uh, I don't know. There's a polemical book that many people hate, but it's interesting that in, in which all all groups are kind of constructed over time historically. And this is Shlomo San's book called "The Invention of the Jewish People," uh, in which. It's a it's an effort to take apart the idea that if you think contemporary Jews are direct genealogical and genetic descendants of the people when the Second Temple was destroyed, you are crazy. Uh, and and so Jewish identity has to be based on something else, right? Than this kind of mythical construction, because I mean, if any people have been moved around, right? Uh, and 
and the Khazars and uh, anyway, there's a that that happens to be a kind of striking example in which someone tried to trace the way in in which uh, you, you do. I'll stop in a second. Um, if you, I promise. Uh, the people who study uh, the Roma in Holland did genetic studies of the DNA of the Roma population, and it's indistinguishable from the Dutch population. And, and I mean, you tell a Hungarian that that's the case, and they'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Please join us at the reception upstairs. <laughs>